Hey guys, welcome. Today I'm going to do some basics of thermodynamics. I'm going to go through some of the basic theories um, and equations that you guys are going to see and then um, hopefully I'll be able to get some videos through where I'm going to actually use these equations. So my objectives for today are to go through the first and second law, um, how to use them and what the symbols mean in them and um, then I'm going to go through what are internal energy, entropy, enthalpy, and Gibbs free energy, and uh, kind of what what they are, equations that were basic equations I'm going to associate them with, and uh, what what these symbols actually mean. And then I want to finish it off with state properties and uh, just a little just a little summary of what they are. So to start. Um, we're going to go through the first law of thermodynamics. Um, so this law is basically just, uh, it's just used as a conservation of energy. And uh, what this law actually looks like is the change in internal energy is equal to heat plus work. Um, now you might ask, well, what does this mean? What is internal energy? Um uh, there's a bunch of definitions that you'll probably see online, but the one that I learned and the one that I think is the most simple to understand is that it's the total energy to create a system. Total energy to create a system. And then one thing I'd like you to note about heat and work is that they are not state properties. So that means they depend on the path taken. And you can kind of forget about this for now, but um, at the end of the video, hopefully it'll make sense when I say they're not state properties because I'm going to go through what state properties are at the end. Uh, so one thing that people get confused about um, in the first law is what the signs mean. So if I'm going to use the, the first law, if I'm going to use this equation, am I plugging in positive heat? Am I plugging, plugging in negative heat? What are the signs that I'm going to plug in? Um, so it's it's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to I'm going to tell you the way I did it, and hopefully you can just stick with it and be consistent with how you do it. So if you have positive heat, that means that heat is being transferred from the surroundings, from the surroundings to the system. So you could kind of look at it as the point of view from the system. Oh, I'm going to actually add up here your units. That's in joules. So if your system is gaining heat, that's positive. So you're just looking at, oh, it's it's getting energy. Okay, that is positive. And it's the same thing for work. So positive work means that work is done on the system. So it's the system is receiving heat energy it's receiving joules of energy by the surroundings so the so the work is being done by the surroundings so that's basically it for the first law it's pretty straightforward um, we're going to jump into the second law so the second law states um, that energy is basically packed together and then it spreads. So what this looks like in an equation would be and your change in entropy is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. And our units are joules per Kelvin. <coughs> so um, when are we ever going to use this? Change in entropy is equal to um, the change in heat over temperature. We're going to integrate that. Um, so we use this law to check that it is true, that energy is being spread apart. So kind of like this. So basically energy is usually going to start clumped up, let's say, and within time, 
it is going to disperse spontaneously like that. So the reason why we use this law is to verify that this is true. So a positive uh, change in entropy will tell us, yes, this is true, that energy has spread out. Um, people also, uh, you'll probably hear, um, that the second law is basically disorder is always increasing. So the disorder of particles is always increasing. Um, stick with whatever way you want to think about it, but I love this energy one. It's probably the most useful uh, for you guys, especially in Chi 220. Okay. So, um, actually, I'm just going to go back for a second. You might see, or you might have noticed already, that I've written a little reversible symbol under here. So, I want to go through what reversible versus irreversibility means, because um, that seems to confuse people as well. Uh, and I just want to make that clear for everybody. So, if I have an irreversible process, what does that mean? So... Here's a pretty easy example. Um, it's simple, but I think it gets the point across. So let's say I have two blocks, one hot one, which I'm going to say is the red one, and one cold one, which um, I'll say is the blue one. And let's say, I don't know, this hot one is at 100 degrees, and my blue one is at freezing point. Well, let's say it's just blocks of water, I guess. Um, so here we go. We oops. So we put them together and they're eventually going to reach equilibrium. And let's say after they reach equilibrium, the temperature is no longer changing and they're staying at 20 degrees. Then when I take these blocks apart from each other, they're still each going to be at 20 degrees. So irreversible er, irreversibility means that I cannot spontaneously make my way back to going back uh, to 100 and zero. In order for that to be true, in order for it to actually go back to that, I would have to apply something. So maybe I'd have to heat up my red block again, or I'd have to put my blue block in a freezer. It wouldn't just spontaneously make its way to its original temperatures. So we call that irreversible. It can't just on its own go back to how it was originally. I think that's a pretty... <coughs> A pretty uh, fair example. Um, and then for reversible, it means opposite. It means, yes, I can go back to what I wasn't originally. So let's say I have this piston filled with air in it. And, and then, you know what, I'm like, I'm going to add some grains of sand to my piston. So I'm going to add sand, 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 sand. And eventually, my piston, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to compress a bit. There's going to be a little bit of compression here when I add those grains of sand. Let me just draw them like that. So when I take these grains of sand off, because my, my, the changes I made were so small, I just added little grains of sand. Well, my piston can go back up to how it was originally. So these two things, these two pistons, are now at the same height. I'm able to reverse and go back to what I was originally. My piston is now going to expand and go back once I take those grains off. So that's what I call reversible. It's something where I make infinitesimal small changes, infinitesimally small changes, that I'm able to go back to what I was when I first started. Um, the difference in that... Uh, my first example for irreversibility, well, the changes I made weren't infinitesimally small. I was I was putting two blocks together. It was a pretty drastic change. But here I'm adding one grain at a time of sand, small, small little grains, like microscopic level that I can't even I can't even see with my own eyes. Um, my changes are so, so small that my piston is able to go back to what it was at the start. So it's not too complicated, but it's just a little, maybe a little insight on what irreversibility uh, and reversibility means. All right. Next. Enthalpy. So what is 
enthalpy. Well, it is defined as the energy to create uh, a system. So that's what we said about um, internal energy. Internal energy is the energy to create a system. With enthalpy, it is the energy to create a system, but we have to add one more thing because it is also uh, the energy to fit it in its surroundings and fit system in its surroundings. And um, the equation you're going to see, well, the first basic equation you'll see with enthalpy is that enthalpy is equal to internal energy plus P times V. So pressure times volume and our units will be joules. Or you could also see it as the change in enthalpy is equal to the change in internal energy plus change in pressure times volume, which will also be joules. Okay, and yeah, that's actually it. So pretty straightforward, just the basic thermodynamic equation that you guys will see. Next, I want to get into uh, Gibbs free energy. So this is defined as a change of a system's free energy at constant pressure. So I'm going to write out the equation. So G is equal to enthalpy, which we just looked at, minus temperature times entropy, or again, delta G is equal to delta H minus T minus T delta S. Our units are going to be joules, as usual. Um, but basically for this class, um, you're going to use Gibbs energy. Um, it's only going to be relevant in thinking, okay, what can the Gibbs, uh, well, for now at least, what can the Gibbs tell me about my change in entropy? So what's important about... Um, your Gibbs free energy is that when the Gibbs is greater than zero, then that's going to tell us um, what's happening with our entropy. So then that means our change in entropy is going to be less than zero. And you guys are going to see the proof in class. I'm not going to go over it in my video um, because you will see that in class and it's pretty straightforward. But yeah, when the change in Gibbs is greater than zero, our change in entropy is zero. And the opposite is true, is true. So if the Gibbs is less than zero, then our change in entropy will be greater than zero. And if our change in Gibbs is zero, then our change in entropy is equal to zero. So um, another way you can think about it is that um, when a chemical reaction happens, um, the Gibbs free energy is the energy associated with the chemical reaction, um, and it's that energy that can do work. Um, so yeah, it's just another way of thinking about what Gibbs actually is. Um, all right, state properties. So I promise you uh, I'd finish off my video with state properties. So a state property um, is something, is a property, so like temperature, pressure, uh, where the path does not matter. So, I'm going to give you a counter example of that, um, which is what I told you guys at the beginning of my video. So, I said before, not a state property, were heat and work. Okay, I said those were not state properties. So that means the path does matter. Path matters. Okay, so here is an example of what I'm trying to say. If you look on the left here, I drew a PV. Um, well, I drew my axes. So let's say I start at this pressure and volume. And I want to make my way <clears throat> up to this pressure and volume. 
Well, I'm like, okay, I, there's a few different paths I can take to get there. There's, there's, there's millions of different um, ways I can get from point A to point B. So let's say this is point A, this is point B. So let's say I'm like, all right, I'm going to take this path. I'm going to go like this. I don't know. That's kind of a funky, you know, it's not going to really go like that. Here, I'll give you something, maybe something more of what you'll see. I don't know. Something simple like this, okay? Or I might say, uh, well, you know, I can go like this from point A to point B. Well, we know that the the area under our PV diagram is equal to work. So if I look at the area under my blue curve, well, that's pretty different from my area under my red curve, right? You guys can see that. The areas under these two curves are very different from each other. Um, say it all, it goes all the way to the axis here. Um, so that means the work associated with those two different paths is going to be different. The areas under the curves are different. So their works will be different. That means the path matters. So whether I'm increasing the pressure first, then keeping a constant pressure and just changing the volume, or if I'm changing both at the same time, that will matter. Okay, so work is not a state property because the path that it takes matters. It will change uh, depending on the path taken. So yeah, that's what I mean by a state property. Um, quickly, I'm going to go over what extensive versus intensive properties are. So extensive, intensive. So for an extensive property, the size matters, size matters. And examples of your extensive properties are going to be V total. So that might be meters cubed, let's say. V total just meaning, um, I'm just talking about meter cubed, not, it's not a molar property. Um, U total, so that might be in joules, um, mass, moles, so those are sizes, so size does matter, that, that will affect, that will change our volume, that will change the mass we have, and then intensive size does not matter, does not matter, and examples of intensive properties uh, are things like temperature, pressure, uh, molar volume, notice how I didn't put that T, so that might be something like meter cube per mole, uh, mole fraction, etc., etc. So, uh, lastly, just a little, you know, just a little fun fact, I guess. Um, our intensive properties come from dividing to extensive properties. So, my example is going to be If I have molar volume, which is here, molar volume is meter cubed per mole. And what is meter cubed? That's volume, and mole is just N. And if we take a look back at our extensive properties, um, here, I'll do this in a different color, maybe red. Uh, here's our volume. Let me just write be consistent, VT up here. Here's our volume, and here is our moles. So we got an intensive property by dividing two extensive properties, VT and N, and that gave us V, molar volume.